Ah, keep my focus on you. Um, you guys just saying, my Savior, first of all, I shall know him. I shall know him. That's, uh, that's wonderful. The, the verse we're going to look at today uh, it comes from that, uh, this song comes from that, I know whom I have believed it. I know whom. This is uh, 224, I won't have you sing it, uh, but 224, I know whom I have believed it. Uh, there's five verses in the song, and verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 all start with, I know not. I know not. Um, I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. Verse 2, I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word wrought peace within my heart. Verse 3, I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through his word, creating faith in him. Verse 4, I know not what of good or ill may be reserved for me of weary ways or golden days before his face I see. Verse 5, I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I'll walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. Uh, when, when he'll come. And then the chorus every time is, but I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able. Uh, it's interesting, I know whom I have believed. We, we want you to leave here, high schooler, college student saying, I know what I believe. But even more than knowing what you believe, even more, we want you to be able to say like Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 1, where he says, I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed. The senior girls, what a testimony. What a blessing. Come through this time in school and, and listen, I, Lord, keep my focus on you. What a blessing. What a message. What a, what a, what a, what a, a powerful thing to proclaim to those that are behind you, ladies that are still juniors and sophomores and freshmen and, and uh, even the ladies in the high school and even to the men. Oh, Lord, help us all to have our focus on you. I know whom I have believed. That's there in 2 Timothy chapter 1. So let's go there. 2 Timothy chapter 1, the, the, the verse uh, that this song comes from, I know whom. Daniel W. Whittle wrote these words. So I know whom I have believed. So that's in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12. So let's go there first of all. Uh, and we'll draw some, some points. Past, uh, Brother Schrock enjoyed that message yesterday. Oh, that was so good. I enjoy coming in here. And Pastor B B Dr. Schreiber, I, I looked again for yours. It hasn't popped up yet. I, you know, he, he preached on that prayer of Solomon last week. And what a blessing. Of course, uh, Mr. Reinhardt on mercy and truth. What a blessing. Uh, I hope you enjoy every time the Word of God is, is open. I hope it doesn't get old. Um, there's a, obviously, a, there's plenty that I could be doing, but I like slipping in here and enjoying chapel with you. Part of it's being with you guys. But boy, a, a big part of it is, hey, God's word is being opened. And I like to be there if I can. What, what a blessing. I hope you don't take this time lightly. Um, uh, just another slot in the schedule. How precious it is when these words are open to us. Um, so 2 Timothy 1.12 says this, For the which cause I also suffer. Is there a cause worth suffering for? Paul, Paul thought so. Oh, Lord, Lord, I'll do this Christian life if I don't have to suffer. I'll, I, I'm not going to be submitted to serve you full time. It, that just seems scary to me. I want to do my own thing. I'll make sure you're a part of my life. Paul thought, for the which cause I also suffer. There's a cause we're suffering for. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed... Um, for I know whom I have believed. So there's a cause and, and there's confidence. There's confidence. I'm not ashamed. I know whom I have believed. 
and am persuaded that he is able to keep that. And, and then there's a commitment um, to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Again, Paul said, I know whom I have believed. A lot of times uh, uh, we want to say, I, I know what I believe. And we do. We want you to know what you, you believe. What does the Bible say? We want to give you facts. We want to give you truth. We want you to say, I, I left there even knowing what I believe about some things. But more than that, not just what you believe, we want you to leave saying, I know whom I have believed. So uh, the, the cause for which he suffers, for the which cause I suffer these things. And, and Paul, Paul, your life is a life of suffering. He's like, oh, I don't want your pity. <laughs> don't pity me. I'm doing great. I, I get to go through life with rich confidence. Rich confidence. That, that rich, wealthy guy over there that, that, that maybe he has his money tied up in this and he's like, ah, oh. you know, a couple, was it a couple years ago during COVID? Remember when the banks were failing? People that didn't have anything in them were like, I'm fine. <laughs> but the wealthy, ah, oh, what if, what if where I have my life wrapped up falls to pieces? And then a believer is like, well, you know, I, I know who... I know whom I have believed. And he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him. That which I've committed, my life, the treasure that is my life. Other people down here, right, the Sermon on the Mount, where he says you lay up treasure for yourselves on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. Those people, I have, I have a whole lot down here and I'm constantly afraid that what if, what if things fall to pieces? And Paul's like, I, I suffer Oh, poor guy. No, 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 I don't want your pity. I enjoy such confidence because when, in, in the bank of my life, there's a vault where my life is being kept very safe and I'm laying treasure up in heaven where moth uh, doth not corrupt and rust doesn't corrode. Dr. Schreiber working on my Ford, trying to find a spot in the bottom to weld something to. It's like, a, it's like okay, this just rusted off. And, you know, uh, the treasures that we have down here, rot, uh, rusting and moth-eaten. But I tell you, you can let, he said, don't, I don't want your pity. I have confidence. Confidence. I know whom I have believed. Just like the lady saying, keep my focus on you. Easier said than done, right? Easier said than done. Uh, Peter Peter was like, Lord, Lord, I'll, I'll never betray you. I mean, I mean, look at you. You're so dear to me. Ah, and then suddenly that night, his focus wasn't on him. Keep my focus on you, Lord. But his focus, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to me? Right? His focus was off of him. And God mercifully drew his focus back to him. And then there was some great weeping. But God in his mercy brought him back and used him powerfully. So first, Paul speaks of a cause for which he suffers. Is, is there a cause worth suffering for? Uh, David thought so, right? He said, that guy down there. He's like, listen, David, you know, when he's down there, he looks like he's that big, right? From a distance. <laughs> David, I don't, I don't know if, you're, if you realize but that guy down there that looks like he's this big, uh, if he comes closer, he's this big. He's gigantic. You, you, you can't talk. Like, like, hey, I, I'm willing to go down there and dispatch him if you're, if you're all afraid. He's telling the men of the army, fear not, for I'm willing to, to do what you're all afraid to do. Because there's a cause we're suffering for. There's a cause we're serving, stepping into. Paul was no stranger to suffering, rejected by those he preached to, betrayed by those he loved and sought to help, beaten on many occasions, left for dead at least once, lied about, thrown in prison. And we're not talking about American prison with plenty of food and soft bed, electricity, warmth, activities, educational opportunities. We're talking rat-infested, cold, dank, painful times where his feet were made fast in stocks after having just been whipped. 
Paul, did you do some suffering? Oh, well, yes. For the which cause I also suffer these things. My Jesus suffered for me, and for him I'm ready to suffer. He is a cause worth suffering for. What matters to him? Well, why did he come? To seek and to save that which was lost. Lord, I want to, uh, the, the cause, you suffered because I was worth it. And may I suffer because you are worth it. You suffered for souls. And Lord, I want to be like my master. I want to do what, it's a cause worth suffering for. Pastor Loman was just here over the weekend. And no parent wants to see his child suffer. You'll, Lord willing, you'll all be, be parents someday. And, and built into your heart, you, you, you might not pray these words, but, but, but Lord, I, I, I don't want to see my kid go through. I, I don't want to see my, would, would you keep my kid from suffering? No parent wants to see his child suffer. So I'm talking to Pastor Loman, of course, Alice and his, his daughter uh, went through brain surgery, went through some things. And some parents might be like, well, Lord, why? Why would you let my child? And you know what? It shocked me Sunday night I was, as I was talking with him. He was saying, I, you know, it's, it's through these hard times that God can bring you to himself. And I fear for the parents whose children never go through a problem that draw them close to himself. A lot of parents would be upset with God for letting their child go through that. And Brother Loman was fearful that other parents might have children that never suffer to the point where they're drawn to him. But the next morning I shared that with my kids. And it's a hard prayer to pray. But oh God, I don't care what it takes what they have to go through. I want my kids to know you. Not, Lord, please keep my children from suffering, but Lord, draw them to yourself no matter what they or I or their mother or their grandparents have to go through. I want my kids close to you. For the which cause I also suffer. Paul said in Philippians 3.10 and following, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. If by any means, this old, this old song, there's a voice calling me from an old rugged tree. And he whispers, draw closer to me. Leave this world far behind. There are new heights to climb and a new place in me you will find. Take the dearest things to me, if that's how it must be, to draw closer to thee. Let disappointments come, lonely days without the sun, if through sorrow more like you I become. Take my houses, my lands, change my dreams, change my plans, for I'm placing my whole life in your hands. And if you call me today to a place far away, Lord, I'll go, and your will I'll obey. For whatever it takes to draw closer to you, Lord, that's what I'll, I'll be willing to do. I'll trade sunshine for rain, comfort for pain. That's what I'll be willing to do for, for whatever it takes for my will to break. That's what I'll be willing to do. A cause we're suffering for. But secondly, Paul says, I'm okay. There's a blessed confidence. Oh man, I have confidence. I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Sure, looking at self, yeah, be afraid that, the, that you'll fail. There's not a lot of strength right here. Keep that focus on Him. And again, it's not what I believe, but whom I believe. Yes, it's important to know what you believe, but may it be 
that because of those blessed truths in the Bible, you get to know Him. It's whom you believe. Not just the facts you adhere to, but the Father you adore. I am not ashamed, he says. Romans 1.16 is another verse that reminds us of this, right? Where he says, uh, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Earlier in this chapter, so if you're there in 2 Timothy chapter 1 still, uh, we can go back. So, so why is he not ashamed? Well, let's, let's look at a little bit of context. Verse 7, so earlier in this chapter, God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Uh, Paul, Peter was ashamed. He was overcome with fear. But that wasn't from God. He wasn't looking to God for his strength. He was looking to self for his strength. And just like Peter messed up that day, we've done plenty of messing up on our own. And God hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so in verse 8, he's telling Timothy. In Romans 1, 16, he said, I am not ashamed. Here in our passage, he said, I am not ashamed. And then he tells Timothy in verse 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord and of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Why would Paul warn against being ashamed of the Lord and of his people? He said, don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Why is he warning Pastor Timothy not to be ashamed? Because I think it's a temptation that sneaks up on all of us. When our faith is weak and we find ourselves not shining for the things of God, but, oh, I'm going to shrink over here and maybe they won't notice that I belong to Christ. Maybe I can dress in such a way that I blend in with this world. I don't want to stand out. I don't want to. I'm ashamed of the Lord. I'm ashamed. Paul said, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. Do we ever get ashamed of the Lord and being around his people? There must be a temptation there. There in, in Matthew 20, uh, 26, that's where uh, it said, and after a while, this was Peter, after a while came unto him, they which stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. Here he's telling Pastor Timothy, listen, be not thou therefore ashamed. I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed. You take your eyes off of him and off of self and see, I, I can live this Christian life. Pretty soon you're tripping up, joining in with the world. Ashamed of the Lord himself and of his people. Paul said, don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord nor of me, his people. He's, uh, he, he tells, let, let's back up a couple more verses. Verse 5. Verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith which is in thee. There's a sincerity. There, there's genuine faith in you. But when it's weak, when that faith is weak, you're susceptible to being ashamed of the gospel and of the testimony of the Lord and of God's people. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also, wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. He says, Timothy, remember, you had people pour good things into you. Me, your, your, your mother, your grandmother, everybody in this room, do you have people pouring good things into you? Do you have teachers? Parents? People pouring good things into you? Don't forget those things. And then he says, uh, and then there's the gift of God. Stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of, of my hands. So God has, has, has gifted him and built, built wonderful things into him. 
So, so you've had people pouring wonderful things into you. You're gifted by an almighty God to do wonderful things for him. Have some confidence. Make sure you keep your eyes on the one who gave it all to you, though. Confidence in self, and pretty soon the very things that gift you will, will cause you to be discouraged. I suppose you can think of this pen right here. Maybe this pen. That, and, uh, and this pen would say, I was built to write. And I haven't done much writing. I feel discouraged. <laughs> and the truth is, this pen wasn't built to write. It was built for somebody to write with it. On its own, there's nothing it can do. It wasn't built to write. And you have these confidences. You, you have, God has gifted you. God has built wonderful things into you. And you have a special blessing that God has poured wonderful things into you. And you might get discouraged. I feel like I, I was designed for bigger things. You were! But just like this pen wasn't designed to write, it's designed to be written with. By itself, it can't accomplish anything. And you might say, I, I feel like I, I'm destined, I, I feel like I should be. You are! But you can't do it on your own. You've got to climb into the hand of Almighty God. It seems like Timothy may have been battling discouragement. Many people believe that Paul sensed that Timothy might have been ready to, to quit. And Paul is trying to encourage him here. God prepared you for this time. Remember all those people that poured into you? He built you for this time. He equipped you for this time. You have and are all you need to succeed. But don't forget Romans 6.13 Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. You're like that pen. You can't do anything on your own, but you do get to choose whose hand you're in. Some pens have written awful things. They were in the wrong hand. Some pens have written wonderful things. They were in the right hand. Think of a letter maybe somebody wrote to you. Godly relative. Pastor or pastor's wife from back home. Maybe they closed it out with a Bible verse. Oh, and you look at that note and think, oh, I'm keeping this. I'm keeping this. And how did they get that information? Well, there was a pen in the hand of the right person. And that needs to be like you and I. Well, I don't, I don't know. We have this, uh, <laughs> you know, let, let's talk to the pen for a minute. Mr. Pen, <laughs> go ahead and get excited about your capabilities. You were designed with great purpose. But remember, on your own, you have no abilities uh, to make use of your capabilities. You've got to be in someone's hand. But remember, there are good hands out there and bad hands. Make sure you're yielded as an instrument of righteousness. You're in those right hands. And Pastor Timothy and everyone in here, don't quit. You have wonderful capabilities built into you by your Creator. And you have been poured into by people that care about you. On your own, you have no ability to make use of your capabilities. In this spiritual battle we are in, you must be in somebody's hand. Have confidence in Him. Where did this confidence come from that Paul spoke about? He says, For I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able. Who is able? He is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Paul knew Christ. His walk with Jesus was the strength of his life. Not only did he know intellectually that Christ was entirely trustworthy, he knew it experientially. He had seen it firsthand. Disappointment comes to all of us. Plans fall to pieces. People let us down. We face personal defeats and broken hearts. How do we keep going? Keep your gaze on the one 
who has never let anyone down, ever. And the last thing here, uh, Paul speaks of commitment. Commitment. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Paul had placed his all into the hands of Christ. Not just his soul, but all there was of him was deposited into the safekeeping of his Lord. All of it. And for him, it was no sacrifice. There's no better place to entrust your soul or all that you have or are than into the hands of Christ. And every day we have to keep climbing into those hands. Again, I love the story of the, the lad with the lunch, right? He, he took his lunch and, 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 and he gave it so that it found its way into the hands of Christ. And the ordinary became extraordinary when it was in the hands of Christ. I don't know, we, you, you guys with the, with the speech, right? The, the, the monologue and, and the, the, the one that, that's teaching theater or whatever. And it's like, be the fly, be the folding table, be the, you know, be the whatever. Um, and uh, be the flower, be the asparagus, be the Brussels sprout, or whatever. He's trying to imagine all these different things, but in a sense, be that lunch. Be that lunch. The ordinary becomes the extraordinary when it's placed in the hands of Christ. Climb into His hands. Hand over the reins of your life continually. <laughs> In this life we find that, Lord, please take the reins of my life. And then suddenly our default sets in, don't we? It does, we're like, we're like, oh, oh, like, whoa, how did I get a hold of these? I thought I gave them to the Lord. It's something you have to do perpetually. Lord, I'm sorry. I want, I want you to have the reins of, uh, of my life. Here, take them. I keep taking them back. You wake up in the morning or, or halfway through the morning and, and something happens and, and you're like, and you're, you're controlling. Ah, stop. Lord, I want my life committed into your hands. You take the reins of my life. It was fun yesterday, Mr. Schrock, talking about his wife, talking about how she makes these meals and she likes to lay out the clothes for the next day. Uh, it's, it's fun to, to enjoy. Uh, what's, what's awful, sometimes men, they, they see a wife as, as a conquest and, and then someone to be forgotten as they move on to the next conquest. But the truth is to, to, to say, oh, I know her better than when we first got married. And there's still so much more to learn. That's the way it's supposed to be. And it, and it thrilled my heart even just to hear him talking about his wife that way. Sometimes we're like, a, Lord, I, I, I find other things more interesting. And we move on as though there's, there's oh, I, I, have, I have salvation. Eternity is set now onto fresh new conquests. Other things that I find more interesting. Oh no. May it be a relationship the depths of which may be never fully plumbed. But I look forward to trying. Mr. Schrock brought this up yesterday with the, the contrast. He, he brought up Balaam there in, in Numbers 22 where he, 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 wanted to, he wanted to get money from Balak. And it was, it was kind of a matter of, 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 Lord, listen, I want that. Why won't you get on board with what I want? And life, is, it doesn't make, it's awful when that's our mindset, when that's our heart set. God, why aren't you getting on board with what I want? And then the contrast was, was Saul, who became Paul on the road to Damascus, uh, where he said, Lord, what do you want? Instead of I want you on board with what I want, it was, oh God, help me to be on board with what you want. And that's why Paul had that confidence. The better we know him, the more we love him, the closer we draw to him, the more strength we draw from him to serve him and to get to know him better still. Sometimes you're like, uh, I, like the, I like the idea of that. 
I, I want to be known as, as someone willing to suffer for Christ. We, we think of Daniel in the lion's den, right? Um, uh, he, he was faithful to prayer. Yep, that would be me. Sounds like me. <laughs> but here's the thing. Daniel was known as someone faithful to God before the day of testing. Some of us seem to be waiting for the day of testing to step it up. But by then it'll be too late. When Daniel got in trouble with the, uh, the, the leadership, he wasn't starting a life of faithfulness in defiance to new regulation. He was continuing a life of faithfulness. Daniel 6.10, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed. Yep, <laughs> That would be me. Just tell me I can't do something. And then on that day, watch me step it up to become mega Christian. Uh, he, he kneeled on his knees three times a day and prayed and, and gave thanks before his God as he did a four time. What about today? Right now. We all intend to be mega Christian down the road when, when the testing comes. Daniel was ready because he was faithful each day. I'll be mega Christian someday, but, but don't ask me today to be careful about the rules of this place. Daniel was careful about... Remember they studied his life and couldn't find one thing Oh yeah, that'll be me. That'll be me. Mega Christian right here the day the trouble comes. Someday they'll tell me I can't pray and then I'm going to be out there praying. Do you pray now? Amen. They couldn't find anything in his life. Is that true of you? If the people in the school and the administration said, I, I need to find something that they've done wrong for whatever weird reason. We just can't find a thing. They're so careful with the rules. Oh, we'll be mega Christians someday. What, what, you got to start now. Yeah. Daniel, as he did aforetime. Amen. How about honesty? Do you, do you read those assignments that you, you claim to have read? Are you cutting corners? Are you putting your name to things that aren't true? Daniel didn't. And he was ready for the day of testing as he did aforetime. You sneak in music? Ah, uh, you know, it, it, it's not the music I'm supposed to be listening to, but I feel really good about God when I listen to it. I don't know how good God feels, but I feel good about God. I well, okay, it's I feel good. There's lots of good music you could be listening to. I know, but there's something wonderful about the forbidden. There's a draw. I'll be mega Christian someday. Don't ask me to be respectful to, to those that God places over me to guide me. Someday, well, I'll be mega Christian someday. I mean, the, the day they say I can't pray, that's when I'm going to start. That's not how it worked. Don't ask me to be careful with my mouth. I feel really empowered when, when I cut down others with my ministry of gossip. <clears throat> I mean, warning. Warning others with the things I think I know. How about living today? the life you should be living. You committed eternity to him when you got saved. What about today? If it made sense to entrust forever into a safekeeping, doesn't it make sense to commit today into a safekeeping as well? 2 Timothy 1.12, what does it say? For the which cause I also suffer these things. 
Paul believed in the cause of Christ and founded a cause worth suffering for. Do you? He says, Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able. Paul had a faith that found powerful confidence in Christ. It wasn't just a matter of what he believed, but whom he really knew Christ. He believed that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Paul's life was a life of commitment. Not only had he entrusted eternity into God's hands, but each and every day as well. All he was, all he had, placed in the best place of all, in the hands of Christ. A little while ago, banks were failing. And pe people were scrambling. Ah, where? Where can I put my wealth where it'll be safe? You know what? A Christian that has just lived a life of commitment has never said, ah. No, the, the best things in my life, placed in the hands of Christ, I never have to worry. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your goodness. I pray that you be with this time of invitation. Thank you again for your precious word. And Lord, I, 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 just, I just thank you so much for the students in here. I thank you for the, the Loises and the Eunices, Lord, the, the godly moms and grandmas maybe, and, and pastors and pastors' wives and Sunday school teachers and junior church teachers and, 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 and godly uh, family, church family, Lord, and others that have poured into them. Lord, you've also gifted them. Each one in here has gifts uh, uh, that, that you, you've given to them, Lord, things that, the talents that they have, a, a, a gifting from you, Lord. But I pray, Lord, that they would not be looking. I, again, as the senior ladies sang, keep our focus on you. And it can't just be a, a, a pretty song, Lord. It has to be a, a sincere, sober prayer that we pray because Peter, oh, he adored you, God. He loved you. I have no doubt that Peter loved you. But it was so easy to get his attention off of you and on to keeping himself safe. And pretty soon he was denying you. Lord, as if Peter can go there, so can I. Help us with these things. Help us with these things, Lord. Help us to, to know that there's that cause worth suffering for but the confidence that we can enjoy in you and then a life of commitment. Help us with these things. I ask all these things in Christ's precious name. Amen.